Well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to do some worship in. This is a Christmas service, right? Day after Christmas. So I'm going to ask Gideon and get, I almost said Gideon and Dina, but Gideon and Melody to come back up. I want to give you plenty of time to do that. Hey, Jeff, can you find my chair? I think it might be back in one of those back rooms. I'm going to try to sit down if I can. Oh, it's right there. Oh, thanks, man. I want to worship the Lord. Did you guys enjoy that worship? Did you? I did. I really, I want to worship the Lord. It's the day after Christmas, so it's just good, good and fitting to worship Jesus. Well, it's funny, when we were worshiping the Lord, I had a, and I was touching the Lord, He was touching me during worship, and I did feel a real purity during worship, just a purity. Anybody else feel that? Just like a cleanness to it. And I had been praying about something, and I didn't have an answer. And this is how you pray, guys. You just go in neutral if you don't know how to pray. And I didn't know what to do, and I was praying, and when I was worshiping, the Lord told me. I know what to do now. He told me, do this. Boom, it's done. I'm going to do what the Lord told me. I really didn't know what to do about this situation. So I'm worshiping. I'm not even thinking about that situation. And right during worship, all of a sudden, the Lord says, do this. I'm like, that's the answer, and I'm going to do it. Isn't that cool? It's like you can't touch the Lord without him touching you back. That's why I really encourage prayer. Guys, if you're not praying, you're just missing out. You're really missing out. You, what grace you're forfeiting because you don't pray. God will talk to you. He'll guide you. He'll take you through tough times. You'll avert disasters in your life. You won't marry the wrong person. You'll marry the right person. Just so many things will happen when you take time to pray. God will change your heart. You could be struggling with the temptation. He'll deliver you from it. But when we don't pray, we're forfeiting. Because in prayer, we're interacting with God, aren't we? Giving and receiving. Prayer is not just, not my message, Gianna, but I'm, I'll, I'll go here for a while. But in prayer, we're not just like saying, okay, Lord, bless my mom, bless my dad, bless Grandpa, help Grace Point. Oh, Lord, help Grace Point. God, uh, bless Pam, bless my dog, Duffy, you know, but check, check, check. Now what am I going to pray about? No, we're actually receiving from the Spirit as we're praying, and He'll pray through us. He'll give us things to pray about. We'll think about people in the church. You know, this morning, someone from the church came on my heart. I just prayed for him, you know, because it came on my heart. I prayed for him. And we're interacting, and the Lord will talk to us. And if you take time to worship, he'll really talk to you. He'll drop something right on you. Boom. How many believe that God is smarter than you are? Man, then you should pray then. Then that, that is enough said. You should pray then because he's smarter than you are. He really knows what he's doing. So I just want to encourage you to that. There's so much grace in it. That's what I want to talk about. We've been talking about joy a little bit. We talked about joy and humility Friday night. Some of you were here. And uh, I just think the, the Bible said when Jesus came, he came to bring good tidings or good news of great joy. And you read in the Bible, Paul is in jail and he's in, knee deep in mud or whatever. He's in the Philippian, I don't know how it was in the Philippian jail. But he's one, I think, was it Philippians where he was in stocks, where he was singing and they had the earthquake? Was that Philipp? It was Macedonia, wasn't it? And he's in there singing to God, praising God in the stocks. And Jeff, remember how I said that we have to learn to walk in joy right now. In the midst of our trial, in the midst of what we're going through, if we don't get victory during the trial, we're not going to get victory. Because victory comes during the midnight hour or it comes during the trial. And I'm concerned for the church, sometimes I feel like we're, if we're not walking in joy, then the gospel is good news of great joy. It's peace on earth and, and goodwill toward men. So I was thinking, well, Lord, you know why? And one of the things I suggested Friday night about the incarnation was the humility of the incarnation. Just God was humble, and it's in humility that our salvation consists. And I want to talk about that, and I'm going to couch that humility and that joy in terms of grace, to rightly understand grace. And that scripture, of him, you know, through him and to him are all things, is a great picture of grace. If we can get this, then when you're going through the trial, you're not going to say, oh Lord, what did I do wrong? It's not going to be a self-focus. Or, oh Lord, why are you doing this to me? That's what, these are the things that people say when they're going through trials. 
and I just had someone say here, Lord, why are you doing this to me? Or what did I do wrong? When we understand uh, grace will start um, rejoicing in tribulation because we know there's a purpose for it and God is going to work something out of that through his grace. We'll quit saying, you know, why are you doing this or what did I do? And we'll get our focus like we did this morning on Jesus. Amen, brother. And he's fine too, by the way. That's fine. I like a little shouting. I didn't bring mine. One of these days I'm going to bring, I got these little signs that say, laugh, <laughs> say amen. I'm going to bring them one day. So turn to Romans chapter 5. And we'll talk about grace. And grace is a part of this joy. And then we're going to worship the Lord some more. I know what it was. And did, did Evelyn go in the nursery? Yes. That's why. That's why. Because, yeah, I, I wanted Evelyn to, but I'll, I'll do that another time. Huh? No, no, she's good. That's good. No, no, we're past it. It was that moment. All right, turn to Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of him, through him are all things. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we joy in our sufferings. I preached on that, was it last week? We joy in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This scripture stuck out to me this week. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Every believer here has the Holy Spirit in them. He's been given to you. He is your counselor. He is your strength. We should learn. Oh, I feel myself rocking off my chair. We should learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. He's in you now. God's given to us. Jesus said, hey, it's better for you. And that's not my message, but he said, it's better for you if I go away. He said, oh, it ain't better. For Jesus. We want you right here, Jesus. No, it's better because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he is going to comfort you. He is going to counsel you. He is going to pour out the love of God in your heart. It's better. You don't have to trek once a year to Jerusalem to see the Messiah. He's going to pour out and talk to you and be in you through the Holy Spirit. And we have access to the Holy Spirit by faith. We have access to God's grace by faith. And I need you to keep that in your heart all year long, all life long. The way that this covenant, the way this thing works is by faith, but it's accessing God's grace. And I think one of the reasons we don't walk more in joy is we don't know what's been given to us. Remember, I've taught a lot on Ephesians 1, 3, that every spiritual blessing, is joy a spiritual blessing? Anybody? Of course it is. Every spiritual blessing has been given to us in Christ Jesus. And Paul talks about peace. So a lot of times we feel like we are deficient, that we're lacking something, that uh, something's missing, and we're, 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 we're busy or struggling trying to earn some righteousness or eke out a righteousness or do something, and we don't understand the fullness that we have right now. Before you do anything, Anything else, you don't have to, as Bob, as what's that Scrooge would say to Bob Cratchit, you don't have to dot another I or cross another T, it's yours right now. And it's through God's grace, not tribulation, distress, persecution, nothing can take away the completeness or the fullness that God has given us in Christ Jesus right now. And it's by God's grace. I've been talking, we talked about, you know, and this is always when I talk about these things, I talked about Jesus, how Jesus divested himself. In Philippians 2, we talked about how that 
Jesus emptied himself, became a man, became a servant. And this was in his humility, the humility of Jesus. And Paul is telling us, he says, not only is Jesus, did, did he die for our sins, or not only is he our role model, and he is our role model, not only is he our role model, Jeff, but he actually becomes our life. It's the humility of Jesus that we make room for in our hearts. It's Christ. It's just like the manger. You know, you've heard this before. There was no room for Jesus in the end. And that's how a lot of times our hearts are so full of things, so full of our own plans, so full of our own ideas, we don't make room for the Lord. But Jesus, although he was king, divested himself, gave up his heavenly glory, and became a man, became a servant, and he died. And that is the way for us too, but we do it by grace through faith. Jesus wants to live in you. And I was so encouraged by Evelyn. This is part of what I wanted to say. And she will talk about the manger. I'm going to have her tell me, tell you guys what she told me about that manger. It's so good. But I was so encouraged. Evelyn was talking about how she was going shopping and, and a couple of different times within recent weeks and how she's bumping into people and people are talking about their maladies and their sicknesses and problems they have, and just by the grace of God, probably to Evelyn's own surprise, she has this love and boldness in her just to say, hey, can I pray for you? She says, I'm done with it. I'm just praying for people in, people in the aisles of the supermarkets now. That's always been what I want to do. I can't say I always do it. I've always wanted to be that way. If it works on Sunday, does it work on Monday? If we can worship God on Sunday morning, can we worship God on Tuesday morning? Can you worship God when you're in trial? Guys, I'm telling you, we win. That's the, I'll get back to that. We win. You win. You're the victor. Christ has already won the victory. You already have the victory. You're already more than a conqueror. You already, faith is the victory that overcomes this world. The devil can't stop you. Trials can't stop you. You're like Jonah. You are going to get where God said to go. If a whale has to swallow you up and spit you out, on your, your Nineveh, it will happen. And if we're trusting God, God's going to get you where you need to be. Someone say amen. amen. We win through Jesus. We lose when we try to figure it out, work it out, worry it out, stress it out. We, when we become childlike and we just revel in the grace of God. We revel in God's glory and in the grace of God, everything that he did in Jesus, and we can fix our eyes on Jesus and look at Jesus and say, Jesus won so I could win. Winning may look different. Hey, what's that shirt say, Pam? About being different? What, what did I say? Get used to different. There's a new way. There's a new life. We got to divest ourselves of the old to walk in the new, and we're going to do it by God's grace. What we do oftentimes as believers, we come in, we give our life to the Lord, and even people that have been saints for 20, 30 years, we give our lives to the Lord, and we don't understand what God has done in this transaction. He has replaced you, He has eliminated you, and He has put the Spirit of Jesus in you, and He wants to teach you to be childlike, so you begin to walk like Jesus. You begin to humble yourself like a child and say, God, I'm in a whole new kingdom. I'm in a whole new realm. I'm in a whole new uh, way of living and way of doing things. And when we learn how to do things God, God's way, it's called walking in the spirit like a child, things start to happen. Miracles are not based upon your righteousness. They're not based upon your goodness. Your answered prayer, the, the miracles, and, and sometimes Pam and I seem like we just walk sometimes, not always, because we go through trials too, but sometimes it's almost like you're walking in a miracle a day. It keeps the doctor away. When you're getting in the spirit and you're getting in the flow, it doesn't mean sometimes that very thing that you want the most, it, it's weird. It doesn't mean all your trials and everything goes away in a heartbeat. Paul said, you know, I've learned to be full. I've learned to be empty. I can get by with a lot. I can get by with a little. I'm overcoming here, but I got a trial. I got a pressure over here. Sometimes that very thing you want the most is eluding you, but God's breaking out in miracles over here. Has anybody experienced that? You've got victory on one hand and you've got trials on the other. And who is sufficient for these things? Jesus. Jesus came. He died. 
And he came to give us a whole new way of living. That's what I'm saying, Jeff. It's by grace, God wants to do this supernatural transformation in our life, and he put his son in there. He's not expecting you to earn it or work it out or do something. What he wants you to do is make room in the inn. He wants to, for you to humble yourself like a child. Joy comes through humility. He wants you to humble yourself like he did. He wants you to empty yourself like he did and allow Jesus to start walking in you. That's what encouraged me about Evelyn. Obviously, she's doing it. She's making room for Jesus. And I know at times past that might have been terrifying to her. But the more you make room for Jesus, things just start happening. How many of you know Jesus lives this Christian life better than you do? Of him, through him, and to him are all things. That's why Paul said, I have nothing to boast about. Let me stay here, Lord. God doesn't only want us to die to sin. You know, Romans 6, I was going to go there. You can reference this in Romans 6. In Romans 6, Paul says that we died to sin. But do you know, you didn't only die to sin, you died to your own goodness. Did you know that? The whole way of pleasing God seemingly under law was doing And many of us understand, I've got to die to sin, or I've got to die to evil. But one thing we don't understand is we even die to our own goodness. That's called self-righteousness. That's sometimes harder for people to let go of than it is their sin. Well, God, I did this, I did this, I did this. Why Why didn't you do this? You're still relying on what you're doing. It's good to do this, this, and this, and this, as long as your motive is right. But if you're thinking that you're going to somehow put God in a a, a chicken wing and say, God, I did this, I did this, and I did this. You owe me something. You're mistaken. It's going to be by God's grace or it's not going to be at all. Let me prove it to you. Flip, Flip over in Romans chapter 11. You guys with me? Am I getting too carried away already? What I want to talk about, what I'm talking about is by grace... We let go of the old. And if we don't let go of the old, we're never going to experience the new. That's what faith is. Faith is, I believe God. I trust God. I am willing to let go of the old life. I'm willing to let go of old patterns of behavior. I'm willing to step out and walk on the water, even though seemingly I am going to sink. Faith is taking that step that you'd never take if you didn't believe that God was with you. How in the world did the church conquer the known world? How did they go all, how did Paul go all over the world? Did he have a newsletter or a YouTube channel? Everybody was sending him money? I don't think so. And he traveled all over. In, and I don't have time. I know, Greg, I really should go contextual here. But I, I want to get a point across here about how grace works. That's all. Paul said in Romans 11, and it, there's a lot here, but in verse 5, he says, So too there is a present time, there is a remnant chosen by, now mine says grace, but by grace. But if by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. I want you to learn. This is, this is really my message. This is how joy comes. When you realize when Jesus said it's done, it's completed, it's through, it's done, it's completed, it's through. There's a new way of living. Talked about it Friday night. There's a new way to be human. Just step back to chapter 10 here. Let me read this. I, I want to build this case for you guys. Romans chapter 10. Paul is complaining because he's trying to reach Israel, but Israel has their own righteousness. They have their own way of doing things. And Paul was trying to convince them to let go of their own way of doing things. It's either by faith, it's by God's grace, or it's not at all. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I want you to know. In the midst of your trial, don't look at yourself and your deficiency. That is failure in a cup. That's your defeat. I'm looking at myself. What did I do? What didn't I do? 
Stop looking at yourself. Look away from yourself. Look at that serpent on a pole. Look at Jesus. Look at what he did. And when you fix your eyes on Jesus, you're going to get where God said go. You're going to do what God said do. You're going to be in the plan of God, and you're going to walk in the Spirit, and you're going to walk in joy, and you're going to walk in victory. Someone say amen. When I talk about praying and how you forfeit God's grace, I'm not saying go pray rosary beads and pray for an hour and now you owe God something again where you put God in your debt. I'm talking about praying so you can hear from God, so you can access God's grace, so you and God are in relationship. You know, when I go spend time with Pam, I'm not doing it so later on things will work out my way. If you're not married, don't worry about it. Wait. I'm snuggling with Pam and spending time with Pam because I love her and because she loves me and I'm rejoicing and I'm exulting in her love. I'm glorying in her love. I'm enjoying it. I'm not trying to work for something. How many times have I boasted on my wife in this church? Every other Sunday, maybe? That's not because she's making me do that. That's not because I'm trying to do something. It just comes out of me because she's awesome. Someone say amen. If you don't think so, you're wrong. It's just natural because I love her and she loves me. And it's, it's, it's built out of this relationship. It's the grace we walk in in our relationship. I'm not under some type of law. What would it be like if you were told you had to love somebody? And I, don't think they, I think they do this in other countries. But here's your wife. Here you go. Here she is. Love this one. Like, whoa. And it's the girl you never wanted to be with, and you're told you have to love her. You'd probably scream in horror. Paul said, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. For I bear witness, they have a zeal for God. You can have a zeal for God and be as far away from God as Biden is from Trump. Someone say amen. amen. I won't go there. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of law. And think about works here. Christ is the end of works righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That means in your trial, that means in your deficiency, that even means in your sin, you don't set about to establish a law or prove that you're good. You go to Jesus and you submit to his righteousness, which is the righteousness by faith. And it's a real, durable, tangible righteousness. Someone say amen. Someone did say amen. Christ is the end of that system. Folks, we're in a new system. Paul talked about in Romans 4, hey, we are dead in Christ, but we're rising to walk in newness of life. Are you walking in newness of life? You can, by faith. If you're not, we need to get saved. You need to turn your life over. You got to learn how to, you know, Paul said, I die daily. In a sense, it's already done. Your death has already been affected. But in a sense, we do die daily because we're learning to walk in the spirit. We're learning, learning to walk in newness of life. It's not just a confession where you're saying, you know, God just doesn't let you get by with just confessing stuff all the time. He's going to say, that's very good that you confess. Now get up and walk. I like the fact that you're confessing, but get up and walk. I like the fact that you say you're generous, but give something to somebody. I like the fact that you say you love your enemies, but pray for them. We're learning this transferal of the old way to the new way. God wants to give you his riches. What does this say in Ephesians? I, I think if we could look at the scriptures with new eyes... Gideon, if we can look at the scriptures with new eyes, he says, I want you to know the riches that Christ has given to you. I want you to know the wealth. Uh, in Colossians 2, 3, it says all the wealth, all the riches are in Christ. And I've got good news. You're in him. You have access to him. He's in you and you're in him. Was it John 17? I'm in God, the Father, the Father's in me. I'm in you, you're in me. We're in this thing together. The riches of God are in us now. We don't need another thing. You're complete in him right now. And I don't mean like the uh, Laodiceans who say I'm rich and I have every. I'm not talking about that type of wealth. I'm talking about heavenly wealth where it's Jesus 
in you. Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on works, that's based on law, that the person who does the commandments finds life through them. I'll try to be more quiet. I really try. What happened to my chair? I, I, when I put that chair down, I really intend to sit on it. I want you to know that. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? What does that mean? The righteousness of faith doesn't say, who will ascend into heaven? What does that mean? You ever think about it? Anybody know? Greg, you know, what does it mean? Who will ascend into heaven? Yeah, who's going to go up and get it for me? Or, as he says, who's going to bring Christ down? Or who will descend into the abyss, Hades? Who, who's going to descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does the righteousness of faith say? It says the word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That's the word of faith we're proclaiming. Because if you believe or confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's beautiful. For with the heart you believe and are justified, and with the mouth you confess and are saved. And that's why Paul says that you're filled with the fruits of righteousness. Because you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you keep on believing in the trial, you keep on believing in the test, you keep on believing during the temptation, you set your heart like an anchor, I'm believing God, I'm being faithful to Jesus. Faith, it's a good word, faith is a good word, but it also is faithfulness. We're going to be faithful to God in the trial. We're going to be faithful. We're going to give glory to God in the trial because we believe that God has never lost a battle yet. So Paul is over and over again. I don't have time because I want to get these. Oh, my, my, my. I, want, I really do want to get you up to worship. So I, I got to do that. And maybe I'll preach more on that in, in coming weeks. But Paul is over and over again what he's teaching. You can reference Philippians 3, 7 and 8, Ephesians 4, 22, Colossians 3, 9. He's always telling folks or teaching, I want you to consider yourself dead. I want you to put off the old person you used to be. I want you to let go. Let go. Trust God. What a concept. Trust God. You believe in God? Believe also in me. You trust God, trust me. It's almost like the Lord, the Bible even says that he's looking around earth and he's trying to find someone that'll believe him. Those crazy people that go into Africa and, 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 and establish churches or they go into third world nations and you hear these testimonies, these are just people that decided to trust God. These are just people that said, you know, I'm going to believe this thing. I'm just going to trust God. And they press in and they go in and miracles happen because they're making this transaction. But not only do we put off the old, we put on the new. Ephesians 4.23, Philippians 3.10, Romans 6.4, Romans 7.6, Galatians 6.14-16. Get the tape. I want to read one more thing and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring this to an end. What I'm talking about is joy comes through letting go of who you used to be and how you see yourself. You were born into a corrupt world. You were taught to be selfish. Ever since you were in the crib, if you had a brother or sister and you're fighting for the crackers, I don't know if you guys have children, they're fighting for the crackers. I want this, that's my toy. No, it's my toy. Daddy, mommy, won't, little Jimmy won't give me the toy. Jimmy, give him the toy, but it's my toy. Go to school and, you know, some kids get your girlfriend, you know, you're like, I can't stand that guy, you know? You just, we're in this world of battle, we're in this world. You get cut from the basketball team. You make the basketball team. It's dog eat dog, we're clawing, we're, we're, we're taught one way to live, we're in competition. We're fighting and warring. We're told to grab all the gusto, push yourself forward, all these things. And when you come to Jesus, it's a whole different way of living. He said, whoever wants to follow me, he said, you've got to die. Didn't he say that? I, Jeff, I wanted to go into the Mark 10 about that rich young ruler. 
Because Jesus was giving him an opportunity. Remember the rich young ruler? I preached on him before. I love that story. When he came, he says, hey, he told Jesus, you know, he says, what do I got to do to get saved? And Jesus said, obey all the commandments. Now, do you think Jesus knew that that guy wasn't obeying all the commandments? Of course he did. He even nailed him, I think, with the one about thou shalt not covet or whatever. Don't defraud. Where'd that come from? He said, don't defraud. And the guy said, hey, I've done all that. And he goes, okay, you just lack one thing. You need to die. <laughs> you need to sell everything you have. It was particular to that guy. You need to sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. It's about his heart. Jesus is saying, <clears throat> I am giving you an opportunity that I've given to 12 other guys. You can follow me and you can be one of these 12 and I will teach you about life. I will pour my riches on you. I just need you to let go of that idol you got. I just need you to let go. That would be a hard thing, wouldn't that? Jesus must have been God. Who else could ask you to sell everything you have and give to the poor? Only God could do that and just stick with it, right? The guy went away sorrowful because he had too much. The Bible says he had great possessions. Jesus was giving him an opportunity to live a brand new life. Do you know those 12 apostles are going to sit on the 12 thrones of Israel? He was giving him a chance to sit on one of those 12 thrones. And the guy said, I can't let go of my money. We've got to let go of stuff. We've got to let go of fear. We've got to let go of doubt. We've got to let go of sin. We have to let go of stuff. It just said, God's no man's debtor. He doesn't need anything from you. He's trying to get you to let go of it because he wants to stuff something in you. He wants to renew you. You're already that person. You're already complete in him. You already have everything you need for life and godliness. Just creak open that hand and receive it by God's grace. And sometimes you got to make a little room in the inn. Got to let go of some fear. Got to say, Lord, I'll do it, but it's got to be you. It's got to be you. It's got to be you. When you start doing it, the more we start doing this, the more walking in a supernatural life becomes normal. Let me read my last scripture. What was it, Jeff? Do you remember? Philippians 3. Yeah, right around there, 310, 3, 7, and 8. So here's what Paul, Paul had visions of Jesus. Paul learned of Jesus. Paul knew Jesus. And this was his experience of Jesus. He said, whatever gain I had, he's talking about righteousness of the law. I wish I had time to be in context. But he says, whatever gain I had, my righteousness, I counted it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. That last song, I think it was, we're singing about how beautiful Jesus is. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them garbage, rubbish, refuse, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but that which comes through faith, accessing God's grace in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on what? Folks, it's your faith. I could go further, but I'm going to end it. It's our faith that we get access to the treasures of heaven. But to walk in faith, we've got to let go of some self-righteousness, some self-stuff, and learn to walk in the Lord. How do we do it? By believing, by being in relationship with God, by trusting Him. You're not going to get better, and then one day everything is going to be okay. You're going to trust God right now in the trial. Remember I said joy, you got to learn to have joy right now in the trial. It ain't going to get better and then you're going to be happy. That ship has sailed. You should know that by now. It's not going to happen that way. You're going to have joy right now in the trial by faith. We're going to believe God right now. Some people say, I got a crummy life. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever said that before. <laughs> you may have a crummy life. Believe God right now in your crummy life. Start turning it over to the Lord. Start turning your life over to the Lord. Say, Lord, make something of me. Do something with me. And believe God and press into it. God will talk to you. I'm telling you, he talked to me this morning. Gave, told me something. I'm going to do something because he told me. 
I'm not making this up. You guys should know that by now. He really talked to me, and I'm going to do something because he talked to me this morning. I'm going to follow the Lord. How about you? I want well, everybody, and I'm, I'm not going to make a long, Gideon, can you and Melody come up? I do want to sing a couple songs. It is before 12. I, I meant to be done at a quarter till. As we're worshiping, just worship the Lord. Don't, I don't even ask God anything. Let's just worship God. But I'm telling you, God's going to speak to you. When you start focusing on him, he's going to talk to you. God, if God ever asks something from you, it's probably something that's hurting you or standing between him and you. He wants to take that because he wants to pour something out on you that's better. Or is God your debtor? God asking you for stuff because he's going to be in debt to you for eternity. Then we just read that God is no man's debtor. You cannot give to God where he doesn't give. But it does take faith, doesn't it, to believe that, to let go of what's in our hand. And I don't mean, if you think I'm just talking about, I'm not talking about what's in your hand. Some it's fear. Some it's worry. Every eye closed, every head bowed, just for a minute. If you're here and you don't know the Lord and you want to give your life to the Lord today, can I see your hand? I'm going to ask you to pray with me this morning. Is there anybody like that? I'm not going to do this long. If you want to give your life to the Lord, you're willing to stand up and pray and give your life to the Lord this morning. Can I see your hand? What you're doing is you're saying yes to Jesus. Jesus, I want to give my life to you. I don't know how to follow you. If you teach me how, I'll follow you. Anybody like that? Okay, second prayer. As we worship God, I just want to worship God in purity. Tell the Lord we love him. Tell the Lord we're seeking him. And we are going to prioritize him. 2022, Jesus, we're going to learn how to walk by faith. We're going to learn how to access your grace in 2022 and just turn it over to you and watch what happens in our life. Watch what you do with our life. In Jesus' name.